Everything is changing. Uh -huh. Yes, we can see. Yes. Uh -huh. So, uh, great. So, welcome everybody. So, this presentation is uh, uh, supported by the Czech Development Agency also. So, we have a uh, longer term co collaboration with the University of Mostar. So it is just uh, for the introduction. So welcome everybody once again, and uh, I will talk about survey design. Uh, very short about me. Uh, my name is Miroslava Bavorova. Since 2017, uh, I am the associate professor at the Czech University of Life Sciences, Faculty of Tropical Agri Sciences. And the before 2008 to 2017, I was senior researchers, uh, researcher at the Martin Luther University Halle Wittenberg. Before 2001 to 2008, uh, researcher at the Institute uh, in Halle, the Leibniz Institute of Agriculture Development in Transition Economies. Uh, my main expertise is in uh, conducting, uh, conducting surveys, I would say. So uh, I established uh, the group, research group on behavioral studies in agri-food sector. And the main methodology that we use is the survey. So we uh, conduct research in uh, different fields like adoption and diffusion of sustainable innovations in agriculture, climate change, and especially the factors. We investigate the factors that affect climate change uh, adaptation of farmers. Uh, we consider the water issues and uh, in the area of youth labor and migration. We investigate the intention of young people to live in rural areas and to work in agriculture. We conduct some studies in food consumption and food security, uh, investigating uh, consume, consumption, consumer behavior and factors affecting food security. And uh, some research also in the area of compliance, like uh, why uh, farmers or restaurants, uh, food providers, processors do or do not comply with uh, laws. And we investigate, uh, for example, some uh, uh, compliance with food quality and safety laws. So you see uh, quite a number of topics that you can cover using surveys. So this can motivate you maybe that also your research that you are intended a master thesis phd uh, thesis research uh, that uh, survey can be quite a good methodology uh, to be used so you can check on our home page that we conduct surveys around the world. So we have a PhD student, uh, Barnabas Bulus, for example, here in the photo gallery on the home page in Nigeria, who conduct uh, and collected the data this year on food security among food, uh, school children. Uh, Mustafa Madaki, who's collected the data on how climate change affects households food security. In Rwanda, a master student uh, collected the data on youth entrepreneurship in agriculture sector. So these are just a few examples. Uh, we uh, have a number of publications that you can check on the homepage of the research group or even in ResearchGate. And uh, again, most of these publications are based on surveys. So using surveys make it possible to um, investigate interesting topics and also to publish the result in acknowledged uh, journals. I would especially like to recommend you uh, the script that we published. So we worked on it with my colleagues, with uh, the PhD students also, and. Uh, published it in the Czech language. It was uh, translated into Ukraine language and now it will be translated also in. You know, I am very sorry, but I do not know Bosnian language or how is your language called? 
Creation. 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 Ah, okay, okay. So um, I'm very sorry for, for this. So I learned uh, something new, so creation language. Uh, so you can use it uh, later when it will be printed. And what is the content of the book? Uh, the book starts with some ethics of scientific work, uh, then uh, it gives information about planning quantitative research design, literature review, uh, how to measure variables and how to design questionnaire. The chapter five is about sampling, which types of sampling we have, which can be used. Uh, then uh, the chapter six is about quantitative data collection, how we can collect the data in the field. And uh, the chapter seven is about data entry and data cleaning. So the chapter seven, it is not uh, so far. We will not manage to come today, but uh, I will try that we will somehow uh, come to discuss uh, about the topics that are published in the other chapters. So I would like to start with the ethics and then I would come to the research planning and uh, explaining the survey design main steps. When we uh, think about the ethic topics to be considered when publishing, so I would like to mention the authorship of the paper so it should be clear and you know sometimes still there are some difficulties with this that the authors are only those who somehow contributed to the paper and uh, i will uh, show you uh, the author statement so uh, usually in some uh, journals nowadays already the credit author statement is used and it is quite good uh, thing because it allows that the co-authors somehow define what was their contribution to the paper and uh, that it is clear and that there are no arguments about the contribution. So an example of a credit author statement is here below uh, and you see the author, first authors, Hang San here, uh, worked on conceptualization, methodology, software. Uh, the other author worked on data curation, writing original draft preparation, etc. So I would uh, uh, encourage you to use uh, such a author statement for most of the work that you do uh, in collaboration with other uh, other colleagues so that you all agree on what everybody did. Uh, the other topic is originality, acknowledgement of sources. The authors should ensure that they have written entirely original works. If the authors have used the, the work ideas uh, of others, this must be appropriately cited or quoted proper acknowledgement of the work of others must also always be given, if not in a authorship, then in an acknowledgement section. So sometimes uh, somebody helps you, for example, with the data collection and this contribution is not uh, like a contribution of a co-author of the paper. So it is not more technical help and so you can write uh, such a person in the acknowledgement. And then the topic of data access and retention. So authors may be asked by the editor, by the journalist to provide the raw data in connection with a paper for editorial review and should be always prepared to provide public access to such data. And the other topic is the disclosure and conflict of interest. When submitting a manuscript, it must include disclosure of all relationships that could be viewed as presenting a potential conflict of interest. So if you somehow would be very much connected with, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, for example, coffee seller in the country and you have a paper on how coffee is good for health, so it can be a little uh, problematic. So 
I exaggerate a little bit here, but you know, it is very often in medical sciences also that uh, there can be uh, some support given by the pharmaceutical industry to the research. And uh, then uh, there can be a little doubt uh, if the results are independent. Uh, fundamental errors in published works. When an author discovers a significant error or inaccuracy in their own published work, it is the author's oblig obligation to promptly notify the journal editor or publisher and cooperate with the editor to uh, retract or correct the paper. If these are major errors or inaccuracies, the author should require a retraction of the published paper. The problem of hazards and human or animal subject. Here, the statements of compliance are required if the work involves chemicals, procedures or equipment that, they, uh, that have any unusual hazards inherent in their use or if it involves the use of animal or human subjects. In many cases, a statement from an ethic committee is required. So it is what we learned a number of times when we submitted uh, papers in the last time, that more and more journals require a statement, approvement by the ethic committee. So we have still a problem at our university that we do not have a committee that would approve um, research in economic, socioeconomic research. So we are working on this. So this needs to be taken into account. What can be the examples of ethical misconduct? For example, the first one, a big misconduct is data fabrication, data falsification, the making up or manipulating of data, inappropriate removing of outliers or inconvenient results, adding, changing, enhancing or omitting results. The other problem is the so-called salami science, redundant publication, unnecessary separation of small doses of results from one project and transformation of them into several publications in order to generate multiple articles rather than just one large paper. Why scientists or why people are doing this? There is a sometimes quite a big uh, pressure on a high number of publications and uh, so the authors try to publish uh, their uh, results in more publications. On the other hand, it is also clear that it is not possible to publish sometimes all the results in one paper because some papers are only six or eight thousand uh, words long, which is uh, the requirement by the journals. So sometimes but for sure, if you publish the results in two or more papers, you should uh, or the topic should be clearly different uh, within the papers. The problem of plagiarism, uh, presenting work of others using their data, text or theories as if it was your own without proper acknowledgement. Uh, there are different uh, degrees of plagiarism and this is a very problematic uh, misconduct. So we had some cases in the last time, especially by politicians. The journalists uh, often check uh, the PhD master thesis of politicians and uh, we have very good tools how to check plagiarism nowadays. So uh, be careful uh, always with plagiarism because it can be quite easily discovered. Multiplication of authorship, omitting contribution of certain authors. Authors uh, uh, is associated with credit, accountability and responsibility as academic, social and financial implications. Uh, so therefore, sometimes there could be tendency to add some uh, authors even uh, they didn't contribute significantly to the research work. So it is a type of misconduct that uh, should not be done uh, as uh, no co-authors should be removed before publication who contributed significantly. So sometimes there is a 
difficulty to uh, define what is the significant contribution. The other problem can be publication bias that occurs when the results of the research influences the decision whether or not to publish the papers. In order to maximize citations, journals prefer manuscripts with positive results and often avoid publishing negative results. So another problem in science. Duplicate submission. Uh, it is again, it can be discovered very easily when uh, one journal paper is published twice, so it never should be published twice. Sometimes it is the problem that conferences in some journals conferences are considered as a not final publication and they do not have a problem to publish uh, conference papers that are not finalized work. Uh, other journals would avoid publication of uh, work that was published even by conferences. Citation obsession journals focus on citations to manipulate their impact factor scores and institutions use citations as a metric for performance reviews and tenure appointments, overlooking the true quality of the publications. The last one that I wanted to mention uh, among the ethical misconducts would be research integrity is compromised. Peer reviews get manipulated, results are messaged or outright faked, and conflict of interests are conveniently ignored. Uh, and this often happens to uh, predatory uh, publishers and journals. So you should be careful with publication by predatory publishers and journals. So uh, first I would like to start to talk about the method choice very shortly and about the topic selection. Uh, methods of data collection. So you can see that uh, we have a lot of different possibilities how to collect data for socioeconomic research. And uh, here you can see the methods of collection of data from informal and less structured to formal and more structured in social sciences. So we are coming for uh, from the conversations with the concerned individuals, community interviews, field visits, reviews of official reports, key informant interviews. So usually methods used in qualitative research, focus group, direct observation, one time surveys. And here it is where we usually conduct uh, our surveys and it is what I will show you most how to conduct the one time survey. We have even data that can uh, provide us uh, with better results, but usually are very difficult to collect because they are very cost uh, costly to be collected, uh, like panel surveys. So these are surveys where we have the survey done uh, in different years with the same respondents. Censuses, so these are usually done by the government when they collect, for example, data about the inhabitants and we have the field experiments. So today mainly we will talk about the one time surveys. I think also most of you will do uh, one time survey. How we decide about target population, the choice is connected mostly to our resources. Uh, how much time do we have for the project? Uh, how much finances do we have uh, uh, for the project? So what is possible? The selection of population depends uh, on the research problem investigated and uh, the statistical population targeted can be, for example, farmers, young people, students. So uh, we know that to conduct the survey with farmers, especially if it is face to face uh, survey will be more demanding. It will take more time and it will cost more money because you will have to visit the farmers, uh, spend time with them, spend time 
on the road. So, uh, and even there are not so many farmers in the area, so it will cost us time and money. So it is what we have to know when we plan uh, research that should be conducted with farmers. But the results are then also valuable yeah, if we put a lot of effort. We can conduct a survey with young people, so it is sometimes easily to conduct the survey with students. Mm, so there are quite a lot of studies also in the psychology, for example, that are conducted with students because they are uh, coming to the universities and it is not so difficult to uh, to conduct the interview with a high number of students, for example, during the lectures. Uh, the study, what is very important, so it depends on our resources, but always the study objective and the study population have to be in line. How we choose the study area, again, the choice is connected to the resources. The study site selection should be properly justified from the scientific point of view. So and the problem that we want to investigate should be prevalent in the area. So the research problem studies has to be relevant for the research area, like uh, we will not conduct uh, uh, research on cultivation of oranges in the Ukraine or in the Bosnia-Herzegovina, because it does not make sense. There are no oranges in these countries, maybe, yeah. So uh, to my knowledge, uh, but uh, for your understanding, it has to be a problem relevant for the research area. So if we have a lot of smallholder farmers in the country, so we will not uh, do the research on uh, uh, agro holdings or big farms. The language that is used, we have to ask ourselves, can we understand the language in the area? will we be able to organize translator? Do we have any contacts? Do we have contacts to researchers in the area, to the institutions? Do we have some uh, friends? So this is also a very uh, important issue and we experience it with uh, our students every year. So because they are going to quite remote areas, so always we uh, support them to establish contacts so that uh, uh, they we have the support from the people on ground. So uh, usually the students or um, in the projects where we are working, so usually the students go and collect the data in their home countries and it is also what I usually support that uh, the uh, research can be done in the home country, in the country where you have some experiences already or where you have a good collaboration partners that would support the data collection. And the basic uh, thing uh, that uh, we have to consider is the safety. So in some of our studies this year, we conducted a survey in northern of Iraq and so it was quite demanding to collect the data because there are some conflict areas, uh, villages uh, that uh, uh, are in the conflict uh, with the neighboring Turkey. So the student uh, had to use uh, some people who still are allowed to go to the areas and they collected the data for her so she uh, couldn't go there herself because it would not be safe. What uh, do we need to consider when we select the topic uh, of our research and the research problem? So I usually recommend that uh, the, you should have a big interest in the topic. So you should share uh, or sh you should look into especially the topics that uh, are of great interest of you so that the motivation for the research sustain required. 
so sustain then uh, the magnitude has to be thinking about so the research should be manageable specific and clear so usually students tend to take two broad topics and then it is very difficult and not manageable for them so discuss it with your supervisors or with uh, your um, your so usually some of your colleagues uh, in case of postdocs or phds and uh, don't uh, select two broad topics the measurement of concept should be clear so you should be clear about the indicators and the measurement of variables so we will discuss about this when we we will discuss today about the conceptual and theoretical framework. The relevance is very important. Your study must add to the existing body of knowledge. So you will find this uh, during your literature review and also by discussing with your colleagues, with your supervisors. Relevance is very important so that uh, especially when you want to publish your uh, results. So your research has to add something new into the body of knowledge in the field and the ethical issues that we discussed already has to be taken uh, into consideration uh, the research design process when we uh, design the questionnaire survey has uh, several steps the first step is to develop the research problem statement and research gap and formulate main objective. Uh, the second step is to define research study framework, the theoretical framework, conceptual framework, formulate research questions and hypotheses and select the data analysis method. Then to operationalize the conceptual framework to define the dependent and independent variables design questionnaire and the design sampling plan so you see it is quite a lot uh, work to be done so uh, you should take uh, enough time especially for the planning and preparation of the research uh, study enough literature so during the literature review you will be able to uh, somehow to uh, precise the problem statement to find the research gap and uh, to define the theoretical framework to design the conceptual framework based on it to formulate the research questions and hypotheses and also the literature review will help you when you see what was done uh, before to select the appropriate data analysis method so when you think about the first step how to uh, develop the research problem statement so you should go from the societal problem so you should think about what is the problem in the society marginal problem so for example it can be lack of labor in agriculture or it can be food insecurity. So it is something that is very general. So you know the area, maybe it is in your country where there is a problem with lack of uh, labor in agriculture. So quite big societal problem. Uh, the research problem could be to investigate reasons why there is a lack of labor in agriculture and factors that affect choice of young people to work or not to work in agriculture. From the research problem that is still quite broad, we will need to formulate more specific research questions. So the research questions uh, may investigate the reasons why there is a lack of labor in agriculture sectors. So the reasons can be migration from rural to urban areas or from one to another county or uh, country or maybe the preference to work in other sectors or maybe uh, there are no resources that the young people could use 
to be able to work in agriculture. So this can be the, uh, the reasons why they do not work in agriculture that you can investigate using a survey. Then uh, the second step, what you can investigate are the factors influencing uh, the decision to work in agriculture. These can be socioeconomic factors. So it can be that maybe female does not like to work, do not like to work in agriculture, or maybe um, people from richer family, families do not like to work in uh, agriculture. So these are the household factors. Maybe the young people don't like that there is not a good infrastructure in rural areas, not enough shops, no culture, or maybe a positive uh, uh, factor that keep them in rural areas could be that they have a network of family and friends. But also one of the factors that can influence the decision could be prestige, uh, that there is a low prestige of work in agriculture and somehow the people do not work, uh, want to work in an uh, area when they are aware that uh, their job will not be acknowledged by the others, by their peers uh, or by the society. So uh, when you think about the research problems, uh, what are the research steps? So uh, first uh, identify a broad field in a broad field of subject area of interest, dissect the broad area into sub areas, select what is of most interest to you and fits the geographical area problem. Then raise research questions, formulate objectives and formulate hypotheses. So first what you have to do that you can uh, define the research study framework and to define the theoretical framework, conceptual framework and the research gaps and to select the data analysis method, you have to review the literature. Uh, the literature review should provide answers to questions like what are the dominant schools of thinking in the field? So our field, socio-economic field. What are the methodological approaches? What concept, terms and proofs exist in the field? What inconsistencies or in contradiction exist in the body of knowledge? What are the most typical research problem and aims in the field? And what is not known or is known with some explicit, explicit limitations? So the first question, what are the most typical research problem and aims in the field? So again, here it is good to discuss with uh, a person who has experience like your supervisor or a person, colleague, you know, that is uh, uh, knowledgeable in the field. And then you can search for some statistics or scientific papers that deal with the research problem of your choice, like uh, studies that investigate the reasons why young people do not want to live in rural areas and work in agriculture. What are the dominant schools of thinking in the field? So uh, usually in the economic uh, sciences, the neoclassical economics can uh, explain some of the drivers. So the labor market theory would tell us maybe that the, uh, the uh, labor salaries are too low, you know, because uh, the supply of labor and the demand of labor should result in a price of labor. So this would be the neoclassical uh, economics that would tell us uh, something is not okay. How can it be if uh, the agriculture companies would pay uh, sufficient salaries? There shouldn't be the problem with lack of young people in agriculture. So there uh, are microeconomics similar. They uh, tell us that the people 
are profit maximizer, rational behaving uh, profit maximizer. And uh, thus it is clear that if the salaries are low in the rural areas, they will tend to go to another and work in another sectors. Uh, so usually in our research, we use uh, the interdisciplinary theories, and it is also the tendency nowadays that the pure economics, uh, somehow many researchers agreed upon that the pure economics theories do not explain all the drivers that the people have for their economics decisions. So we use also theories from the sociology, sociology but especially from psychology, psychology uh, such as uh, behavioral economics or also from law sciences uh, and uh, the theory of institutions. So these are, there are a number of different theories and a number of different concepts. So this can be a quite a difficult part uh, at the beginning of your research. So uh, this, uh, this uh, to find out what can be the background, the theoretical background of your study, you will need some time and uh, you will, nowadays uh, it is uh, easier that you have uh, so much uh, information that you can find in internet so you can even google you know theories uh, used for migration for example and uh, you will have to evaluate the information but you will find uh, i uh, i uh, uh, bet that you will find good information about theories that explain migrate existing theories that explain migration so use uh, uh, this theories discuss it with your supervisors and um, these theories will explain you to understand the behavior that you try to understand so this example what we have why young people don't want to work in agriculture for example why they migrate and the methodological approach also can be found in the papers uh, on the topic. So uh, you will uh, find out, it will be described in, in the papers, how the researchers collected the data and how they analyzed the data. So in the field uh, on migration or uh, the field why people do not want to work in agriculture so you will find many papers and also in our research we very often use the multiple uh, regression analysis multifactorial regression analysis to analyze the data so it is something that will be very helpful for you when you want to decide about the methodological approach and it is very important that you decide before uh, that you decide before uh, you will go to data collection about the, the methodology because uh, it will be very much connected how you will ask the question in the questionnaire how you will design the questionnaire so that uh, the variables that you will get from the questionnaire will fit to the method of data analysis that you decided for what concepts and terms exist in the field. So what you have to look in the uh, previous papers, you uh, have to find the definitions. So uh, you, if you will talk about young people, about youth, so you will uh, have to find uh, the definition of youth. You will maybe find that they are different. So you will have to decide for a definition that you want to use in your paper. The same, it can be that there will be a different uh, definitions of occupational prestige. So again, you will have to clarify which of the definitions do you use in your paper. And you will also find uh, the effect of uh, the independent variables tested so it is uh, again quite important uh, step that in the theories and especially also in the empirical 
work in the field, you will be able to identify the variables. So independent variables are those that affect the dependent variable. So the independent variables can be socioeconomics like age, gender, income, households, variables like number of members of a household or income, perceptions, what do the respondents think about uh, living in rural areas, uh, how important, how he or she perceives that nature is important for him. So these can be the drivers and uh, the independent variables that affect our dependent variable, the variable that we want to explain, like migration from a village to a city. The next question that you can clarify by uh, literature review or have to clarify what inconsistencies or contradictions e exist in the body of knowledge. And uh, for example, you will go through five papers or more papers on the same topic and you will find that there are different effects of the same factor of the same independent variables uh, variable that were found out. So, for example, in Italy, it was found maybe yeah, so like uh, example that age does not play any role in migration from villages to cities, but maybe in the Czech Republic or in Bosnia Herzegovina, you will find that uh, uh, if the people are very, uh, maybe that they uh, the age plays a, a role there. Even with the age, it can be, uh, yeah, yeah, one example, but also with the gender can be in Italy, the female maybe will migrate more compared to male in the Czech Republic, it can be the others. And this can be a good justification for uh, your empirical research. So you will have to uh, say that uh, the previous uh, results uh, uh, shows contradictions and inconsistencies, and it is a very good base uh, for your research. So there uh, are other and there are other studies um, necessary to uh, find out. And uh, the sixth uh, uh, question that you can discover during the literature review, what is not known or is known with some explicit uh, limitations? What is the research gap? So very important thing uh, that we said will show that uh, your research adds something new to the existing body of knowledge. So, for example, you will find out that you will not uh, see any studies that investigate the effect of perceived prestige on willingness to work in agriculture or the effect of land ownership no, on uh, the mm, migration. So this can be a justification. This can be a research gap and a justification for a selection of your topic. So you can check uh, later. Uh, I uh, provide here a link on the discussion with the uh, professor about the literature review. So I will share with you this presentation and uh, you can check in YouTube if you uh, want so to get more information about literature review. The second step in the questionnaire survey uh, design process is to define research study framework, the theoretical and the conceptual framework. So as I told you, this has to be based mainly on the literature review discussion with people who are more knowledgeable in the field and uh, you should uh, then decide about the theoretical framework which is somehow broader in scope compared to the conceptual framework. It is more general, less structured, more loosely defined and is derived from theories that already exist like uh, new 
or you know they they can be different uh, new institutional economics theory for example public choice theory so different types of theories that already exist uh, provide the basic foundation for a research study and it is a starting point of the discussion makes the readers ever what uh, follows even in the theoretical framework, the theoretical background could be more in general the behavioral economics. What is the different uh, difference in conceptual framework? The conceptual framework is narrower in scope, is very specific. Dif uh, the structure is uh, very well defined. It, it is derived from concepts and specific variables that may be identified in the study itself and should be identified, provide the structure. And uh, it is uh, very specific. So I can show you here the example of a conceptual framework. Uh, so the example can be we, uh, our dependent variables, what we want to explain is climate change awareness. So it means if a respondent, for it can be a farmer, is uh, knows that there is climate change or if he or she does not know. And uh, we uh, conducted a literature review and what we found that in the previous studies it was found that age, gender, education, education in biology or ec ecology, the grades in biology, ecology and other factors can affect the probability if our respondent knows or does not know about climate change. So this is uh, how the conceptual framework looks like so it is something that is very very uh, specific the next step is to formulate research questions and hypothesis uh, which types of research questions uh, do we have in quantitative studies so we have two types of research questions and uh, descriptive and inferential the descriptive questions ask about the description of dependent and independent variables and the inferential relates the independent and the dependent variable. Inferences can be drawn from the sample to the population. So if we think about the example, the researcher wants to examine the relationship of land ownership and use of reduced tillage by farmers. So try to think a little. The researcher wants to examine the relationship of land ownership and use of reduced tillage by farmers. So the descriptive research question would be, it is just a description of dependent or independent variables so the question would be formulated like what is the share of land the farmers own? How many farmers use reduced tillage? So these are more simple question. If we would go to the inferential question where we relate the independent and the dependent variable, the question would uh, be, for example, how does the land ownership affect the use of reduced tillage by farmers. So if you look at the descriptive, in the descriptive we have only one variable. So this is for example uh, how many farmers use reduced tillage in the interfer uh, inferential. We uh, create a relationship between independent and dependent variable. So we have the relationship here between land ownership and we want to investigate if it affects the use of reduced tillage. So the 
uh, if we uh, go back to the conceptual framework and the formulation of the research question so it uh, if you will prepare the conceptual framework it will be much more easier for you also to formulate the research questions so the descriptive one would be does age affect climate change awareness and the inferential could be uh, for example uh, do is there any relationship or it is uh, sorry this is inferential already because we have uh, the the relationship between age and climate change awareness thus age affects climate change awareness or if it would be only descriptive would be uh, what is the uh, average age of uh, people who are aware of climate change so i i hope this is clear so the research question can be much more easily uh, formulated if you have a good conceptual framework so this is a, a hypothesis formulation so sorry for the title so this is hypothesis formulation which types of hypothesis do we have uh, first we have a null hypothesis that makes a prediction that in a population no significant relationship exists between groups on a variable so an example would be there is no significant relationship between the ecological awareness of a farmer and use of chemicals and then we would uh, use the hypothesis test and we would uh, the statistical test allow us to know if uh, from our um, sample we can generalize the result to the bigger population and if our hypothesis is valid for the bigger population of our interest the alternative hypothesis that we usually use in the socioeconomic research uh, can be directional hypothesis or non-directional uh, hypothesis the directional alternative hypothesis is the researcher makes a prediction based on the prior studies that suggest potential outcome so an example here would be the more ecological ever the farmer is the less chemicals she or he uses so we know from the previous literature that the more ecological ever the farmer is the less chemical she or he uses therefore we can use directional alternative hypothesis but if we do not know from the previous literature from the previous theories what is the relationship between the variables we uh, use the non-directional alternative hypothesis and uh, this would be ecological awareness of farmers is related to the use of chemicals so we just want to test that uh, what we assume that the ecological awareness of farmers is related to the use of pesticide of chemicals but we do not know if it increases or decreases so again we can go back to the uh, conceptual framework and you see also it will help you to formulate the hypothesis because you will be able very clearly to see which independent variables uh, you want to test uh, the effect of independent variables on the dependent variable so the first hypothesis could be age affects climate change awareness but uh, we do not know here the direction so it is in directional hypothesis the gender affects climate change awareness okay you have so, one way. sorry one, one students have a request for 
Okay. This, uh, okay. So you may ask. Do you want to ask a question? No, you have one request. One student's wait to to uh, join to this lecture. Please accept him. So do I have to accept? Uh, somebody else can't accept. Yes. So maybe some. Uh, so usually. So it's. No, hello everyone. I already accepted him. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So I thank you. Thank you. So I will continue. So when we developed the research problem statement and uh, formulated the research gap and main objectives, uh, when we defined the research study framework, the theoretical framework and conceptual framework and formulated the research questions and hypotheses and selected the data analysis method. So as I told you, usually uh, when we are able to formulate a good conceptual framework where we know uh, the effect of the independent variables on the dependent or where we want to test the effect of the independent. So we usually use the uh, multifactorial regression analysis. We need to think about the operationalization of conceptual framework. So we will need to define the dependent and independent variables. The operationalization is a part of the empirical research project process and is in social sciences. It is the process of converting theoretical concept into indicators, indexes and variables that can be tested empirically. So it is what we did in the conceptual framework and uh, you know the operationalization in survey design. It is usually that we uh, create the, we designed the questionnaire with the variables that we identified in the theories and the previous literature. And we design uh, questions that what we will uh, discuss a little later so that uh, we can test our expectations and our hypothesis. So we have the dependent and independent variables. I think most of you understood already uh, or most of you know already what are dependent and independent variables. The dependent variables are those uh, that are of most interest of, uh, for us. So for example, we want to investigate uh, the migration. So the dependent variable would be this person migrated, the other one didn't migrate it. So the dependent variable show us if the respondent migrated or not. The independent variables, so these are the variables that change the depend or that they have effect on the dependent variables. So like uh, the gender age, so the gender and age affect the probability of migration. So for example, females uh, will migrate less or more probably than males. So we have different types of variables, so different scales. So this is important to know before we are able to design the questionnaire because we need to know when we design the questions in the questionnaire, how we can measure the variables that were selected from the uh, literature. And it can be sometimes a little, again, demanding. So we have uh, categorical and continuous variables. The categorical can be nominal or ordinal, and the, the continuous interval or ratio variables. 
so the categorical variables are also called like nominal measured on the nominal scale scale and they have no quantitative value so the nominal scales could simply be called labels uh, the subtype and you will very often hear uh, it uh, of a nominal scale with only two categories is called dichotomous or binary variable the nominal variable for example, could be what is your gender, male and female? What is your hair color, brown, black, blonde, gray or other? Where do you live, north of equator, south of equator or nadir? The ordinal scale give us a little more information already. So before we just know the label, somebody is has brown or blue eyes but uh, we do there is no order of the values so in the ordinal scale we have this order of values and an example is how do you feel today very unhappy unhappy okay happy very happy so you see that in the answers uh, for this question you have an order from very high, unhappy to very happy. Another example, how satisfied are you with our ser service? Very unsatisfied, somehow, somewhat uh, unsatisfied, neutral, somewhat satisfied and very satisfied. So again, we have an order in this uh, ordinal scale very often in social sciences we use the Likert scale to measure variables so we use them as answer categories in the questionnaire when we design the questions and the scales the answer categories there are five or seven point scale which is used to allow the individual to express how much they agree or disagree with a particular statement. So this is uh, what helps us in the socioeconomic sciences to measure something that um, somehow is abstract and uh, would not be um, measurable uh, man otherwise. The Likert scale that contains five values is ordinal and the Likert scale that contains seven or more values is often uh, considered as continuous scale but uh, you know also there is uh, the one of the most uh, famous uh, econometricians uh, professor Woodridge who say that even five uh, scale, uh, five, five point scales, uh, Likert scale can be treated as continuous in the econometric models, and it is also what is very often done. We can use the variables that were measured on the five uh, point Likert scale, that we can use them as a independent variables in the models, regression models. Here uh, we have some examples of the possible recur uh, Likert scales. Uh, when we come to the continuous scales, we have an interval scale uh, that are numeric scales in which we know not only the order, but also the exact differences between the values. So example is the Celsius temperature because the differences between each value is the same. When we uh, have the scale that I mentioned before, very satisfied, very unsatisfied. So we do not really know if the distances between the options are the same. But here in interval scales, we know. The last type of the continuous scale is the ratio scale and it tells us about the order the exact value between units and additionally we know and it has an absolute zero 
which allows for a wide range of both descriptive and inferential statistics to be applied. Uh, so absolute zero, what does it mean? 20 degrees, if we uh, think about the previous example of uh, Celsius degrees. So here we do not have absolute zero, therefore it is only interval scale. 20 degrees is not twice as hot as 10 degrees because there is no such thing as no temperature but when it comes to the Celsius scale. Examples of ratios, uh, ratio variables are many, like age, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, distance in meters, kilometers. Uh, the name ratio reflects the fact that you can use the ratio of measurements. So, for example, a distance of 10 meters is twice the distance of 5 meters. So, uh, different as uh, with the Celsius degrees. We have here these four levels of measurement of variables, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Why it is important for us to know? Because uh, there are uh, operations uh, and calculations that are allowed by the different types uh, of the measurement scales, uh, by the nominal, we only can calculate mode, counts, and frequency by the ordinal, also median, minimum, maximum, or range. Uh, by the interval, we can uh, also calculate mean, variance, standard deviation, difference between variables can be interpreted, and addition and subtraction of variables is also possible by the ratio scale we additionally can use multiplication in and uh, division. So uh, how can we design the questionnaire? There are three main steps uh, for the questionnaire design. First, to determine the questions to be asked, then to select the question type for each question and specify the wording. Design the question sequence and overall questionnaire layout is the last step. How we determine the questions. A key link needs to be established between the research aims and the individual questions. So research objectives and the hypothesis. Question can be determined through a combined process of exploring the literature, thinking creatively and the discussion with uh, or um, actress, so not only the literature review, even though this is the basic, uh, maybe also you will be uh, somehow, uh, you will have a new information from, uh, uh, from discussing with the experts in the field, so you can uh, even add questions derived from these discussions. And the, the goal of the process is to generate the focus for individual questions that can then be designed in detail. So you have to decide how the variable of your interest from the literature review or qualitative survey will be measured. So you first have to think about formulation of the question and then you have to think about the formulation of the answer options. We have a different type of questions like open and closed questions, single versus multiple responses questions, ranking questions and rating questions. Uh, in the quantitative surveys we usually use closed questions. So it means that we provide the answer option in the question and only those questions we may analyze using quantitative statistical methods because we have numbers for the answer options. Uh, we sometimes use also some open questions, usually very few, that are helpful to explore to get more information about the details of the problem that we, we maybe didn't consider before. Uh, so the example could be, uh, what do you think 
are the reasons for migration. And then you would get a lot of maybe possible reasons from the respondents and uh, they would tell you what could be the reasons for migration. If you want to have a closed question, you would provide the answer options. Uh, do you think low prestige of work in agriculture is caused by hard work, boring work, low paid work, tick if appropriate? So you would be able already to calculate. So you would mm, see how many respondents answered that they think that the low prestige of work in agriculture is caused by hard work. The single versus multiple response questions. Uh, an example, do you think low prestige of work in agriculture is caused by hard work, boring work, low paid work? If uh, you would have a single response question, you would ask to tick only one of the response possibility. In the multiple response questions, uh, you would ask the respondents to tick all response possibilities that apply. And uh, to decide if you want to include single or multiple response questions, you would have to ask how do I want to analyze the data. And the other type of questions is the ranked responses questions. Do you think a low prestige of work in agriculture is caused by hard work, boring work, low paid work again? And here in this type of questions, you would uh, ask the respondent to indicate by numbering from one to four in order where one is the most important. So you see you have additional knowledge here about uh, how the respondents or the the uh, or the the reasons and the rated uh, responses uh, would be uh, do you think low prestige of work in agriculture is caused by and then circle the number under the initials that applies very important, important, neutral, unimportant and very unimportant. And uh, the respondent could provide the perception regarding hard work, regarding boring work and low paid work. And uh, he could provide the answer if he, if he or she think that this factor is very unimportant important, neutral, unimportant and very important for low prestige of work in agriculture. And this rated responses questions are very often used in the socioeconomic surveys. So this will be the questions uh, that you will for sure also use when conducting socioeconomic research and survey. So uh, then uh, you will uh, you will have to think about the answer options that we discussed and about the question sequence and questionnaire real, uh, questionnaire real, uh, layout. So the questionnaires first you will have to write a short introduction, then divide the questionnaire in parts and number all the questions so that you later are able to link the questions and to identify the questions when you will insert the numbers in the, for example, Excel file. To, to come a little bit uh, also to the sampling plan. Uh, so how do you decide what are the possibilities uh, for sampling, how you select the respondents. We uh, usually would like to have a probability sampling, which is ideal. So it is representative of the population from which it is drawn and therefore statistical generalization about the population can be made on the basis of the analysis of the 
sample data. So uh, it is a, a ideal sampling, but usually very difficult to achieve. The non-probability sampling is every case in the population does not have a known probability of being included in the sample. Therefore, the representativeness of the sample may be compromised. So the idea behind, as I mentioned, by the hypothesis testing is that we can't interview, we can't involve all people from uh, that we would somehow like to from the study population uh, in the study because it would be too expensive. So therefore we select some respondents uh, and uh, here, as I say, if we have the possibility to use the probability sampling so that each uh, person in the population has the same probability to be chosen, we can generalize and uh, we can uh, say that the results that we have in the sample are valid also of the whole population of the inter of interest. By non-probability sampling, it is more difficult, nearly uh, impossible. Uh, we have different types of probability sampling, like random cases are selected at uh, random, as in a lottery, in a roulette wheel, or using a table of random numbers. So if you think about farmers, so you would uh, have a number or you would have the list of the farmers and using a lottery or mm, so usually or a random uh, numbers of the farmers and selecting randomly. So you would have uh, the random sample. Uh, sample. And then the stratify, uh, stratifying uh, sampling. So stratified population is divided into groups by characteristic appropriate for the research questions like age, income, profit or location. And then the sample is selected from each group. So this is the stratified sampling. Uh, and then the next possibility of the sampling is the cluster sampling. When the population is divided into segments and then several segments are chosen at random. So it can be uh, like streets. So you would select the streets in a city when you conduct a consumer survey and then you would uh, interview all the people in the street. So what is usually the problem? That not all people uh, who would like to participate will participate in the survey and thus um, again you would have a problem with the sample and the sample would not be random. Uh, the non-probability sampling can be quotas as so it is the sampling that we usually use in our studies. Uh, so I think also for your future studies, th this will be uh, most uh, uh, probably the sampling methods that you will use. So you can use quota sampling. Cases are selected on the basis of set cr criteria like gender, age, income group to ensure that the sample has a spread of cases in different categories, even though some of those categories might be small. So it is when you conduct a survey on a marketplace and it should be consumer survey. So you would think about how much of uh, female and male you have in the population 50-50. So you would have the quota 50% male, 50% email, uh, female and uh, or age groups. So again, you would think how much uh, young people, all people are in the population and you would try to ask uh, people similarly as uh, you have the distribution in the population. The purposive sampling, uh, the sample is handpicked for the research 
and use the when the researcher already knows something about the specific cases and deliberately select specific ones because they are likely to produce the most valuable data. The convenient sampling, the sample is built from cases which are accessible, such as the organization in a certain region or the members of a social networking site. So it can happen quite often. So we uh, select uh, some uh, villages uh, that uh, are in the area that is, are not so far, for example, from the area that uh, where the student live. Yeah, so then we have to say that the sample is convenient. Snowball sampling, it means that when you go to the village, to the place where you collect the data with farmers or with consumers, that uh, you ask maybe the farmer if he knows another farmer who would like to participate in the survey, etc. So this is called snowball sampling. Uh, the problems in social sciences, uh, in reality, most social sciences research relies upon non-probability samples because boundaries regarding who might or might not be included in the population are vague. It is very difficult to compile a complete uh, sampling frame, although there may be a variety of partial lists of members of the population held by various organizations or government agencies. And I, it is unlikely to achieve 100% response rate. So it means what I mentioned by the streets that not, not everybody will open the door. If somebody calls you by phone and wants to interview you so there will be many people who will not want to uh, answer so it means that uh, the response rate will not be 100 percent not all people who were asked will not answer uh, so therefore we will not uh, have uh, very rarely we will be able to have a random sample so very shortly to data collection so before data collection, there is a need to conduct a pilot survey test of the questionnaire on a small sample of your subjects to find out if the uh, subjects like farmers, if they understand the questionnaire, if they do not understand some questions, you will need to adjust those questions. So we have different types of uh, data collection methods like face to face and voice interviews uh, or indirect methods like postal survey using paper questionnaire, electronic questionnaires, and uh, there are some advantage and disadvantages of uh, postal survey. So the advantage is lower cost than face-to-face -face, uh, face -face interviews. What is the disadvantage is that there is a lower response rate. So the advantage by the postal survey, the people can uh, answer also later. So by the face to face, you will have to visit them in place. Maybe they will not have time at the time when you will come. So uh, you can uh, check it also later in the script when you will uh, have it so it is much more described in the detail. Uh, we can use uh, also computer programs or mobile phone applications to collect the data. So in the last uh, surveys, uh, if there is internet connection, if there um, is uh, electricity and if it is possible, so we use the mobile phone applications uh, because the advantage of the mobile phone applications like the open data kit, Cobo Collect Box. So I somehow uh, encourage you if you conduct the survey to use uh, and to check uh, the possible applications that can be used because it is then uh, much more easier to uh, in, uh, insert the data because you will not have the paper form and the data will be directly for example, in an Excel file. So you just will need to clean the data 
and you will uh, be able to start the data analysis. So you will not need to work on the step that you will have to uh, insert the data from the paper form uh, to the to the electronic form. OK, so we came through the nearly through the whole script. Do you have any questions at this point? So I uh, I'm very sorry I rushed a little bit because uh, usually uh, we have this seminar for the whole semester and today I tried to briefly introduce all the topics that uh, uh, have, have to be considered uh, when designing a survey. So uh, sorry for rushing a little bit. Uh, I hope I could inspire you to read the script uh, later and to conduct a survey research. So if you have any questions, I provided you the my email address so you can contact me. I will share these presentations with my colleagues from uh, uh, from your universities and uh, you can check uh, again. OK, Mika, okay Mika. Mika, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite interesting. Even uh, I would like uh, if you can uh, maybe one time uh, to show us uh, some practical examples, <laughs> it would be good. And also I want to thank you for the book that you donate to our faculty. They are already in a library available to our students and to our colleagues too. So uh, once more, thank you very much. Uh, our professor Zvinka Knezovic, uh, who is teaching our students on this model, was uh, he 